All right, so this week I'm preaching on uh, Mark chapter 6, verses 14 through 29. Sometimes I wonder if Brett sees like a chunk of scripture coming and says a few weeks out, Nate, do you want to preach that week? And I'm like, yeah, that's fine. I don't know what the scripture is. And then I read the scripture. And I'm like, Brett, you got me again. I don't know if he does that on purpose, but sometimes he, he man, he sends me some uh, Oklahoma phrase here, some humdingers. And so it's like we've got Jesus sending out his disciples, Jesus doing all this healing and helping people. And then we've got John the Baptist being beheaded. And then we've got back to Jesus going out and helping people. Well, I, I'm going to be preaching over the death of John the Baptist today. And so. When I first started reading this, I was like, golly, Mark, what is going on here? Like, why did you just include this random chunk of darkness? And so uh, as I was studying it and looking to people who are way smarter than me to help me study through it, I started to see that this is an example, a really good example. Mark's a great writer. This is a really good example of foreshadowing. What foreshadowing means is It's when an author or the writer of a story will hint at or give you a picture of something that's coming in the future of the story. To foreshadow something is to hint at uh, what's going to happen in the end or uh, something that's about to happen to a main character or something like that. That's what foreshadowing is. And this is a perfect example of foreshadowing. Mark uses a historical flashback. That's what this is. This is a flashback to... uh, to something that's happened in the past that is relevant for the present, and it's foreshadowing something that's going to happen in the future. I'm going to go ahead and read uh, this scripture over us before we get get rolling any further. Uh, Starting with verse 14. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work within him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. And when he heard and when he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed, in this he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Pretty brutal and kind of random, but this is an example of foreshadowing. This John the Baptist that we're talking about right here is the John the Baptist who was the messenger preparing the way for Jesus. He's the one who went out saying, one is coming who's going to take your sin. You must repent so you can believe in him. John's the one who went out preparing the way for Jesus. And what happened to John 
is really similar to what is going to happen to Jesus. John was, he was like a man's man. Like, John probably fought fires with shorts and boots on. John was a tough guy. He ate locusts and honey, lived out in the wilderness, and wore camel hair as his clothing. So he was a man's man. He was a tough guy. And in this setting, he's in Galilee. It's in the city, someplace that he doesn't need to be. And he's telling this king, dude, what you're doing is wrong. John didn't have to be there. He didn't have to live in the city. He was strong enough to live out on his own, do his own thing. But John was on mission, living in this city and preaching what God had told him to go and preach, and that's repentance. And he even preached it to the king, the leader of this area. And so that's kind of a, a little bit of a, a background for John. Uh, who he was and what he was doing. And it's really relevant to us today. Um, we're capable of going out and doing our own thing, but we, just like John, are here to be on a mission to proclaiming the good news of Jesus and repentance. We don't need to do that. John didn't need to do this to survive, but he did it because that's what God called him to. God calls us all to the same thing. Um. But this is a historical flashback uh, because Jesus' name is being made known. This is an important part. This first verse, it starts with, King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. What had Herod heard of? He heard of Jesus sending out his disciples. The first time Jesus sent out his disciples and gave them authority over uh, unclean spirits. Jesus gave these disciples authority, and he sent them out, and Herod heard of it. That's why Mark includes this here. Herod heard of it, but there's a lot of weight behind Herod hearing about what Jesus is doing. We'll get into that here in a minute. Um, But first, let's talk about who this Herod guy is, this King Herod. A lot of us, when we hear that, we think, oh, yeah, is that king who was there whenever Jesus was born and he tried to kill all the innocent kids and all that kind of stuff? Well, this is a different Herod. This is that Herod's son. That Herod had a lot of sons. This is Herod. Antipas. That Herod had a bunch of sons, and so his kingdom was split up between these sons, and when it says King Herod, that's probably a title that Herod Antipas, this one right here who killed John the Baptist, that's something that he called himself and wanted other people to call him. He wasn't really the king over this whole land. It's more of like a tetrarch. He took care of a portion of it, but it kind of reveals his pride and his a spiritual state that he wanted these other people to call him king. And so Herod wasn't really a king at all. He was just a ruler, which is still a big deal. He was the ruler over Galilee, which isn't something to be taken lightly. Um, he was a powerful political person uh, within the Roman Empire. And so it's not like he uh, it's not like he didn't have political might or power uh, as a, a leader over this area or a ruler over this area. But that's who this King Herod is. And when he hears about Jesus, it's a big deal. Because Jesus, in his eyes, he thought that Jesus was John the Baptist risen again. So this is terrifying for Herod. Herod was scared of John the Baptist when he was alive. And he was scared of, in, uh, in Matthew, he says that, that Herod was scared of John the Baptist's followers. He was terrified of these people when he was alive. I can only imagine how terrified you would be if the person you had beheaded was alive again. And so that's why this is a very heavy and important chunk of Scripture. This mighty guy beheaded John the Baptist, and Jesus comes, and he thinks that Jesus is John the Baptist risen again. And so that's why Herod is uh, is so worked up about this and why it mentions so much about him. It says here that Jesus' name had become known. Have you ever wondered why Jesus, when he would heal people, sometimes he would tell them, don't go tell anybody. Here, I've healed you. 
You're good to go, and don't tell anyone. It's like, what? I thought as Christians we're supposed to go and tell everyone. Like, I thought that's what we're supposed to do. It used to confuse me, and, I, and in studying this, it's like God kind of shined a little bit of light on this. Jesus was telling them that because his earthly ministry wasn't done. When I saw that, when the Holy Spirit showed me that, I was like, ah, that makes sense. I get that. That's why Jesus always told them, don't, tell, don't go tell anybody because I've got a lot to go and do in the short time that I'm here, my earthly ministry. I've got a lot to do. And if you go tell people, then my name is going to become known sooner than it should. And the timing isn't going to be what, it, what it, he wants it to be. And so that's just a small thing. But when it says that Jesus' name become, had become known, that's not a small phrase either. King Herod heard about it, the rulers, the, the Roman power had heard about this Jesus. And so the end is getting closer because they're not going to like him. Um, but that's why uh, he told people not to go and tell what he had done for them. It's all about his timing. Even the timing of Jesus entering into like the timeline that we understand of history. Uh, when Jesus entered into and came to the earth, that timing was impeccable because he came right as the Roman Empire had expanded, had exploded. And so there's this common language, and Jesus enters into that so that his name can be spread like wildfire, but can't be put out. It hasn't been put out yet. And so his timing of even just entering into what we understand here on earth as time was perfect. Um, he told people not to tell others what he was doing, uh, even after this, uh, even after verse 14. He goes on to tell his disciples, don't tell anyone about this. I've still got more to do. Even after his name has become known to Herod, he still says, don't go tell people because I've got more to do. His earthly ministry wasn't done yet. He had a lot more to do there. It's not like he was just rude or mean and said, I'm going to do this for you, but you can't tell anybody. Like, that doesn't make any sense, but now it does. Now it makes sense. Um, and the timing of the greatest moment of all time wasn't perfect yet. Uh, Jesus' death on the cross, the greatest moment of all time, the moment that every sacrifice in the Old Testament points to, and the moment that everyone after it looks to as their being holy in God's sight, that moment is above everything else. And that one moment, the timing of Jesus needed to be perfect. And so he was telling people, don't go tell other people what I'm doing because it's not the right time. But he became known to Herod, Herod Antipas. There's a few things that, uh, or there's, there's one big thing, I should say, that I want to focus on every time we talk about Herod, Antipas, and the rest of this scripture. And that is his, his spiritual state. We've got two things going on in this chunk of scripture. And that is John the Baptist giving ultimately into the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. And we have Herod Antipas giving into the flesh and those desires that are anti-God's spirit, that go against everything God says. Herod's walking this line, and I'm going to point out a lot, uh, and it's mainly sexual sin, where Herod keeps going back to that, opposed to John, <clears throat> through persecution and being jailed, continues to rely on the spirit and walks in the work of the spirit. Um, and so let that be... Uh, Something that you're thinking about as we talk more through the rest of this scripture. But in verses 14 through 16, we see that people thought Jesus was a few different things. Um, we read that some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, thinking Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead, uh, that this is why miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah, and others said he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. And there's a reason for these weird different views. We read that as kind of outsiders of this 
biblical culture. Um, and it's kind of like, well, why did they pick those three things? I don't really get that. Well, John the Baptist hadn't been dead for long. And so people thought uh, it was a contemporary belief that people could be raised up again. Maybe that was a possibility. It wasn't a Jewish belief, but it was a contemporary belief of Herod and some of his teachers that he listened to and took counsel from um, said that, well, maybe he was raised again. That kind of fit into their structure of how the world worked. For the structure of the Jews and how their world worked, how their worldview worked, um, they either thought that Jesus was Elijah who had come again or that he was a just another great prophet of old. The reason they thought this is because Elijah didn't die an earthly death. He was taken up and promised to come again. And so they said, well, maybe this is Elijah. Come back. That goes along with everything in the Old Testament. I guess I shouldn't say the Old Testament because they didn't have a New Testament. The New Testament was happening. So in their Bible, their Jewish Bible, they said, that goes along with what we've heard. And so that fits into the way we think the world works. And so maybe he's Elijah. And others said, well, a lot of the old prophets who came had power like that and spoke in the same way because they were so close to God. Maybe maybe he's just another prophet. But Jesus himself said that John the Baptist was the greatest prophet who had come. And he also said that John the Baptist had come in the spirit of Elijah. And so both of those things are pointed towards John the Baptist, not to Jesus. Jesus knew that's how people were going to be thinking about him. He knew that's how Jewish people's minds worked. And so he says in Matthew, he says, I'm not Elijah. Come back. I'm Jesus. I'm Christ. Peter says, you're the Christ. And Jesus, yeah, I am. And so he's not Elijah. Come back. He says that if anything, John the Baptist was back in the spirit of Elijah. He says, I'm not a great prophet like the old ones. Um, He's the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. But the one that Herod got hung up on was that he was John the Baptist, that Jesus was John the Baptist returned from the dead. And it's totally understandable that he got hung up on that. Because Jesus was doing these great things, these miraculous things, similar to what John the Baptist was doing. What Jesus was preaching was the same thing John the Baptist was preaching. John the Baptist was preparing the way and saying, repent, 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 one is coming. And Jesus was saying, repent, 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 I'm here. And so the message was even very similar. And so Herod's like, oh, no, I killed this guy and he's back from the dead. And so, of course, Herod is uh, worried about this. Um, It'd be terrifying. I mean, can you imagine if you killed someone and then they came back from the dead or you thought they did? It'd be a big deal. And uh, moving on, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about why Herod killed John the Baptist. And this illustrates again um, the penalty of sin. And this is uh, hitting on sin of a sexual kind. Verses 17 through 19. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Herodias here and what's going on with this whole situation. Why Herod would do something that it says he didn't want to do. Why he would do something he really doesn't want to do. And the answer is he's wrapped up in sexual sin. John was like a counselor to Herod. Herod was a little confused by what John had to say, but he heard him anyways. He was uh, enticed by what this repentance was that John the Baptist was speaking about. And so let's, let's lay out who Herodias was. She has a name that's really similar to his. It's not like she, he renamed her when he married her. 
and he just called her Herodias or something like that. He didn't give her a new name. Herod didn't. Her name when she was born was Herodias because her dad was a son of Herod the Great. Awesome. So they're related. You have Herod the Great. He has these sons. One of them is Herod Antipas that we're talking about here. Another one had a daughter named Herodias who married one of Herod Antipas's brothers. Okay, so kind of the sexual sin here is pretty evident already that his family doesn't have it all together. And so, or maybe they do. But anyways, she married her uncle, essentially, Herodias did. And the reason she did so, because she wanted to work her way back up the ladder to power. It's what she wanted, okay? And she used these men to do so. It's clear because Herod Antipas was the ruler over Galilee. It was a big deal compared to the rest of them. And so Herod Antipas went and visited his brother, liked his wife, and they had an affair, who was Herodias, and Herod Antipas had an affair, came back, and Herod Antipas brought Herodias with him. And John was like, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. That, is, that goes against the law of God. And it's interesting here that John the Baptist would tell Herod this, who's not a believer. Herod's not a believer in Jesus or in the, the Jewish God, but John the Baptist tells him anyway, hey, that goes against the moral code that God designed for the world, like not just for believers, but this goes against the code and how he designed the world to be. And so John was like, you can't marry your brother's sister, who is also your niece. You can't do that. But uh, Herod ended up putting him in jail anyway. Now, Herod could have just killed him there, but this shows that Herod was interested in what John the Baptist had to say. He feared John the Baptist. It says here in verse uh, 20, Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man. And so, because he feared him, Herodias wanted him dead. Herodias was like, you are getting in my way to power John the Baptist. I want you dead. And so, she had a grudge against him. Um, That's clear. But Herod said, hold on, hold on, hold on. I like what this guy has to say. I'm kind of interested in what he's got to say. This preacher has good advice for me, and so I'm going to keep him around so I can, you know, hear his advice and have him around. I'm going to keep him in jail. I'm going to take care of him, and I'm going to imprison him, which is weird. He took care of him by imprisoning him. Put him in jail so he'd be protected from Herodias and whatever she could plan to do to him. Um, And so he was imprisoned, and that's how the king took care of him, but he also was selfish and wanted him there so that he could, you know, seek his counsel whenever he wanted to. Herod is walking a very fine line that a lot of us walk today. Herod is hearing the truth of God through John. He's hearing the truth that he needs to repent and trust in Jesus. Hearing that truth. But that's all. He just likes hearing it. It's dangerous for us in this room today to come here on Sundays and to or go to community groups and to like what we hear, you know, like, oh, yeah, I'll listen to this. Uh, Nate, he's going to be here for a long time and he's going to be preaching or Brett's going to be here for a long time. They're going to be preaching and uh, and we'll just go and listen to it. And if eventually I want to really believe in it, I will. But, you know, I just like to hear it. It makes me feel better whenever I leave. That's what Herod's doing, similar to a lot of people in churches in America today. And similar to a lot of people in churches in America today, this Christian gets beheaded. And I'm talking about the church across the globe. And we'll get on to that in a little bit. But I ask you now, if you have been here and you come here and you listen to what's taught and you like what's taught, and it makes you feel a little bit better, but you haven't really believed in it, 
they haven't really believed in Jesus as who he says he is. It just makes you feel better to come to church. I want you and I pray for you to believe in Jesus as your righteousness. Because it's all vanity otherwise. I'm not saying that Jesus hasn't brought you here to hear this repeatedly, to hear his good news repeatedly. I'm not saying that he hasn't brought you here and lined this out for your life, for the timeline of your life. And so I'm not telling you don't come. You know what I mean? Definitely come. Be a part of the church. Come come hear good preaching. Not when I preach. Come hear good preaching whenever Brett preaches. But believe in Jesus. We're not just here to come to a place where we can feel at home with other broken people. That Yes, that's part of it. That's not the only reason that we're here. The number one reason that we are here is to trust in Jesus more and more and more each day, to hear his word and to worship him by believing what is taught and seeking to apply it in our lives. And so if you are like Herod, I ask you to believe in Jesus um, and to know that you're not alone. <laughs> doesn't mean that you're worse than anyone else here because everyone in this place is in equal need of the love and the work of Jesus Christ for us, myself included. You're not alone, and I ask you to believe in Jesus. Um, but moving on, if you'd like to talk about that after uh, when, when Eric comes back up here and plays, I'll be in the back. We can talk. Um, let's see here. Where was I? So again, um, when, when Herodias wanted John killed, Herod was like, no, 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 no. I like what he has to say. I'm going to keep him over here, and I'll go do my own thing. And whenever I want to hear his wisdom, I'll come and ask him for it. And that's how I live my life. And so he had a decision to make, but it's almost like he didn't want to make the decision to either just go do his own pagan thing or to believe in what John was saying and who John was preaching, which is Jesus. He didn't want to make that decision. And so just like what's going to happen to everyone who ever exists, a decision is going to end up coming to a point that you can't just not make the decision. You can't just say, I don't want to deal with it now. There's going to come a point when you have to. That's what happens to Herod. He thought he could protect John, just keep him in prison and use him. But, in verse 21, an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. So an opportunity comes. This opportunity is for Herodias and her grudge and for Satan and sin and darkness. But... Uh, well, we'll get there later, but the, the, an opportunity comes, and this opportunity is founded on Herod's sexual sin and his pride. Sexual sin is a dangerous, dangerous thing. It is something that grabs you, and you may not even see it, but it's got a hold of you, and it's going to demand of you way more than you think it's going to demand of you. You think it's going to be one pop-up, one mouse click, but it's going to end up a wedge, trying to wedge between you and Christ, you and the light. It's going to rip apart at your family. It's going to cause you to do things you've never thought you would have done that you hate to do, but you do it anyways because it consumes like sin and Satan like to do. And so we, what we see here happening is Herod having a big birthday banquet for himself. And he invites all the greatest men around to come to this banquet. The way this would have happened is Herod and all these great men, all these military leaders, political leaders, 
just great citizens, like the I don't know, cream of the crop or whatever you want to look at it as. All these guys come together for this big party, and they're in one room, partying hard, drinking hard, and the women are probably in another room. That's the way these parties went back then. The women were in another room, the men were in this big room, in room, in this big room um, feasting and drinking and all that kind of stuff for Herod's birthday. And Herod's like the leader of all of these people. And so he brings all of them in for his birthday, and he knows that he is over all of them, and he's going to give them a good time, and they're going to like him and be happy that he was born for his birthday. And we see that in verse 22. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. It doesn't go into a whole lot of detail here, but you can only imagine what kind of dancing happened. A bunch of men, young girl comes in, dances for them, and it pleases them. And so this is a pretty clear indication of Herod's entanglement in this sexual sin. Along with marrying his brother's wife, who was his niece, after having an affair with her and this kind of stuff. It was tangled. But it's important to note that John kept telling him to repent because no matter how far into the sexual stuff he thought he was, John knew to just repent and believe in Jesus. Just repent and believe in Jesus because it doesn't matter how heavy all of this stuff is or how entangled you are. The light of Christ eradicates the darkness. So believe, believe, repent, repent. You can't do this. You got to stop doing this. Just repent. That's why John kept telling him, because no matter how dark it seems, the light of Christ is brighter than that darkness. But we see Herod ultimately giving in to the flesh. Because um, after she had danced and pleased Herod and his guests, the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it to you. Only imagine how much he had had to drink. He's probably kind of puffed up with pride, having a good time with all these great guys. You, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. And he vowed to her. This repeats it, and this time says it's a vow. This is getting serious. And he vowed to her. This is an oath in front of all of the leading men of this area. All of them. That means like the, the judges over here at the courthouse. Heads up, guys, at the police department. Um, great people and politicians that live in the city of Muskogee. The uh, mayor. Everyone who was big was here. And he vowed to Herodias' daughter, whatever you ask me, I will give it to you up to half of my kingdom. Half of his kingdom wasn't much, but it was kind of building himself up there, same as having everybody else calling king. He said, I'll give you up to half of my kingdom, which is a very small portion of our kingdom. But anyways, and she went out and said to her mother, who was Herodias, who hated John the Baptist, who had been waiting for this opportunity, for what should I ask? She's probably super excited. This girl's like, yeah, man, they think I'm hot. Now they're going to give me stuff? Like, what should I ask for? You know? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. No exclamation point here. There's no like explanation or anything. Just a period. The head of John the Baptist. Does that not feel cold? Incredibly cold. This grudge had hardened her heart, made her a very, very cold person. Her daughter comes in super excited about getting some cool stuff. Mom, what should I get? What should I ask for? The head of John the Baptist. All right. What does the daughter do? She came in immediately with haste to the king. So she ran as fast as she could to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Herod was enjoying his rule. 
being king over all of these powerful men, partying hard, drinking, feasting, entangled in sexual immorality, living the high life, had John over here he could go to when he felt bad and wanted some counsel, kept doing his own thing, though, thinking, this will never, this will never come down on my head. Boom. It does. All at once, immediately, and with haste, it came down on his head. I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. This isn't just your regular bummed out kind of feeling. The king was exceedingly sorry because he had the decision in his face of do I repent or do I live in this fleshly state that I've been enjoying? What do I want? Do I want the light of Christ or do I want darkness? He was exceedingly sorry because he didn't ever want to have to make this decision and because he already had. He already had made the decision. But because of his oaths to his guests, he did not want to break his word to her, and immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. Immediately. Immediately he was faced with the decision that his life had been hinging on, and immediately he made it, and he said, go get his head. And the executioner brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When I said foreshadowing at the beginning, I wasn't just meaning that this was foreshadowing Christ's death. Jesus goes before Herod Antipas, the same guy, later on in the Bible before he's crucified. And he gives the same kind of sympathetic washing his hand. I don't want to. I don't want to make this decision again. Goes back to his typical Herod ways. Faced with the decision, I don't want to make it. You guys do what you want with Jesus. Same thing happens to him, but when I said foreshadowing at the beginning, this is also foreshadowing the life as a believer. Do I mean that we're all going to get our heads cut off? I don't think so. I don't know, but I don't think so, but some are. We've seen ISIS rise up, behead believers. We've seen false prophets rise up and say, if you believe, you'll be rich and you'll be happy for the rest of your life and lie to us. And tell us, if you only believe in Jesus, give me some money for this special little tube of water. And you'll be happy for the rest of your life. You just sprinkle that tube of water on your head. Not the truth. Those are the words of liars and those are the words of false prophets. The word of Jesus says, this kind of stuff is what happens. Just to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow does that mean that you're going to have your head cut off? I don't think it necessarily means that. Does it mean that you will be persecuted? Yes. If you were like John, on mission, telling those to repent who have incredible amounts of power over you, you're going to come up against resistance, and there's going to be persecution there. So ignore the false prophets who say it's going to be all pie in the sky. And trust in Jesus who says, it's not yet. Jesus promises that all the weight of sin and evil in the world is going to serve as a great contrast to life with him on the other side of death that Jesus has conquered. The greatest thing that the enemy, if you're a believer, the greatest thing that the enemy has against you 
those letters d e a t h death it's the greatest thing he has against you and christ already conquered it nothing to fear not even death itself because christ has conquered it that is why john said to king herod antipas repent john loved him he told him the truth even though it meant his own death he told king herod antipas the truth and he didn't stop i'm sure he could have worked out a plan with herod to get out of prison and to go off to some far off place i'm sure he could have worked something out i'm sure I know John could have survived out in the wilderness because he already did. He stayed on mission there, even though it meant having his head cut off. It's like something out of a horror movie. Something so dark that it's kind of where we think it belongs. Oh, that's just in a horror movie. Or that's in some other country. Something like that. That's what's happening here on earth to our brothers and sisters. And so what is to stop us from doing our part here? Knowing that others are willing to go that far, and we really don't have to worry about that here. What is to stop us? Why have we gotten so apathetic? speaking about myself too it's like whenever i'm driving around and i have uh evie in the back seat of the car and i get to drive and i forget she's back there kind of you know like listening to music or whatever going on a long drive thinking my own thoughts i forget the precious thing that i'm carrying around I forget the precious mess message that i have inside of me because day-to-day -day life happens i forget that, that message needs to be proclaimed everywhere even to the people who can bring down the, the sword across their necks. The kings and the rulers, where we're at now, forget that they need to hear it. But who am I, you know? Why would I tell these people that? It's not really my place. They have their own system and that kind of stuff. Look at John. I'll tell you this. Jesus goes on to say, in Matthew, find exactly what verse it is. It's Matthew 11, 9 through 11, where Jesus says that John was the greatest prophet to have come from a woman. John was the greatest prophet. He goes on to say, and every believer is greater than him. I'll read it. Matthew chapter 11, verses 9 through 11. Okay. What then did you go out and see? A prophet? Talking about John the Baptist. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is Jesus speaking. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I will send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. Jesus says that even the least of believers, the least of the kingdom of heaven, are greater than John the Baptist. We can all take part in that because if you're honest with yourself, you definitely feel like the least of these. What does he mean when he says that 
were greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist didn't see Christ crucified. John the Baptist didn't witness the resurrection. We have seen it. We have proof. We have the most infallible history text in the world right here. The Bible, the Word of God. It cannot be disproven, and it will not be disproven. It's still here. In this, we see what happens. We see the end of Jesus' earthly ministry and the beginning of his worldwide, global, universal ministry of bringing us all into his family. We've seen that, and we know that that's the truth. And that is what makes us greater still than John the Baptist. We know how the story ends. We saw and have seen through the truth of Scripture what Jesus has done for us. And we take that truth and proclaim it. We proclaim repentance and believe in this man who is God. We have that. So let that give you fuel for the fire of sharing the gospel. I know it is dark. I know it is really, really dark. Sin and evil. When we come to see it. When Jesus shows us the light of himself. It makes it really clear what isn't light. It makes the dark evident. Things that we didn't think were evil or dark are incredibly heavy now. Sometimes, as we're working throughout our lives, we trip and slip and get that darkness on us. It's clear. You can smell it. it. starts to seem like it's a part of us because it's all around us. But believer, what you need to know is that it cannot overtake you. The darkness cannot overtake you because the light and spirit of God himself reside in you. It cannot be overtaken so long as you believe in Jesus Christ. So when you go out there, when you feel it, And when it's too clear how dark it is, remember that the work of Jesus resides in you. It is what gives you the ability to go and share the good news. So by the strength of God and His Holy Spirit in your heart, in your soul, Go and share. And the pray for us. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you that we can be honest, and that we are the least. Thank you that you have made us the greatest in God's eyes because of your identity for us. Help us daily to fully trust and grasp hold of you and help others to do the same. Amen.